Okay, thank you, Yoko, and um, thanks so much for organizing the, the seminar <clears throat> with the logistics of having it in person and on Zoom. It's great to actually um, come and watch in person. So it's a pleasure to introduce Alex Cheeseman. He's been uh, a research associate at JCU now for several years, and uh, he's going to present about ozone, tropospheric ozone, ozone in the lower atmosphere, and the impact on tropical trees. And this is a project that uh, Alex initiated with some colleagues in the UK at the University of Exeter. And he's built this uh, fantastic experimental facility here at JCU, which is um, in the environmental research complex. And uh, there's, not, there's little known about ozone impacts on tropical trees. And, and this is certainly the first uh, facility of its, of its type in Australia. So it's, um, it's giving some really interesting results, although still certainly in progress. Um, but Alex will tell us more about that. Uh, welcome, Alex. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for coming, uh, both in person and those on Zoom. Um, and thank you very much for the introduction, Lucas. Um, uh, as some of you may know, I have been at JCU in one class or another since about 2013. Um, and I'm working on a number of different projects, uh, including working with uh, Lucas on issues of adaptation, acclimation to uh, temperature in tropical trees, uh, working with Paul Nelson on the use of um, uh, new technologies for the bioremediation of excess nitrogen running out to the Great Barrier Reef Lagoon, and this project. This is an ozone project, and I'm going to be talking about that solely today. Um, uh, as Lucas mentioned, my capacity at JCU is actually a seconded employee of University of Exeter, so I'm actually a University of Exeter employee, that's why I've got that uh, contact detail up there, but I am also based in E2 if anyone actually wants to come find me. So today we're going to be talking about ozone and what is ozone? I think it's worth just uh, introducing you all to it. Basically, ozone is a simple little molecule, three little oxygen atoms bound together, highly reactive. It wants to oxidize everything and anything. Um, it will, if it, anyone remembers, there used to be laser printers in every office. All laser printers got moved out into uh, common, well-ventilated areas because the ozone that they were forming is actually detrimental to human health. And there was actually uh, studies which showed that if you work in an office next to a printer, you're actually um, fumigating yourself with ozone every time someone prints something out. Um, I'm not going to talk about the human health implications of ozone, but I am going to talk about the implications on vegetation. And this is what we're talking about. The ozone reacts with, oxidizes, and destroys plant uh, biomass in the leaves. And that has implications upon a whole number of things. That's what we're really here today to talk about. To give you an uh, a quick uh, introduction to the talk and what I'm going to be discussing today. Um, I'm going to introduce to you ozone because I think it's important we all know uh, what we're talking about. I'm going to briefly touch upon the formation of ozone. Um, we can talk about the global trends that we're observing in ozone concentrations around the globe. The impacts that is shown to have in many systems and then specifically what the impacts in the tropics are likely to be and off the back of that I'm going to introduce you to the tropos uh, research program, which is something that both Lucas and I are involved in. As part of that, I'm going to introduce you to the new experimental facility that we've built here at the JCU campus, at the Numa Buddha uh, Cairns campus. I'm going to introduce you to the experiments that we're conducting, the kind of data we're collecting, why we're collecting it. Um, and I'm going to touch upon, although I'm not an expert in, I'm going to touch upon how the data we're collecting here in Australia is feeding into these models, both at a global and regional level. Uh, including additional uh, monitoring of ozone being conducted at various sites around the world, and how that's all being brought together to look at the implications of ozone on, on tropical systems. And I'm also going to then finally finish up by talking about some of the future experiments and the work that we're conducting currently over the environmental research compound, not 200 yards that way. So something that I think is worth reiterating is um, the ozone is, is a natural part of the, of the world around us. It's naturally formed by chemical processes in the, in the atmosphere. And indeed, I'm sure you're all aware of the ozone layer. This is a region in the upper stratosphere uh, in which we see a higher concentration of ozone. And that's actually a great thing. It um, absorbs UV radiation that's coming in from the sun. And in being absorbed, that ozone is then converted back to oxygen. And we get some level of protection from the UV rays and we don't get skin cancers. So ozone in the upper stratosphere, very useful, very important, uh, very good. There's a lot of research. I'm sure people are aware of the potential hole in the ozone, and this is why we changed 
the uh, from away from the use of CFCs to maintain that ozone layer. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is lower in the atmosphere, in the troposphere. Um, and ozone there is a serious problem and is very detrimental to both human health and natural systems. But as I said, it is a, a, a natural component of atmospheric chemistry. So I won't go into the details of all these various processes and competing titrations and all sorts of things. But it's important to know that you know, in a, a natural system unimpacted by humans, there will be ozone present at low levels. And there's various competing chemical processes that both form the ozone, but then also have that ozone react with um, components of the atmosphere. And uh, for example, we would have volatile organic carbons, VOCs, that are emitted by plants. You know, plants uh, give off things like isoprenes, terpenes, and such like. These organic carbon molecules interact with nitrous oxides that naturally get emitted by, say, a wetland. In the presence of sunlight, they interact and they form um, ozone. That's all fine. The problem comes that human activities have massively increased certain components of these, of these various processes. In particular, we have uh, led to huge emissions in nitrous oxide and VOCs from anthropogenic activities. And a, a nice example of this, I think, is perhaps uh, given by the city of Manaus. So that if you're if not familiar, Manaus is a city of about 2 million people, slap bang in the middle of the Brazilian Amazon, surrounded by I wouldn't say pristine forest, but certainly vegetation. Um, but we have a highly industrialized center, uh, which is a source of nitrous oxide. There's uh, electrical generation from burning fossil fuel. There's diesel trucks, there's people's cars. We have very high uh, concentrations of nitrous oxide that are emitted in Manaus. And that airstream then travels downwind where it passes over natural, semi-natural um, environments, which are emitting a lot of organic carbon from their leaves. Those two interact and we get ozone. So we don't necessarily get high levels of ozone in top downtown Manaus, but we do get it downstream in the downwind areas. And if you look at this kind of model output, we're seeing this quite distinct plume of ozone that you see kind of spreading out. And that continues for many kilometers out over what is, what would be considered untouched and unimpacted uh, forests. And so it's that combination of high nitrous oxide and high VOCs that leads to the high ozone. And this is often demonstrated by these so-called isopleth diagrams. And these are basically uh, the outputs of cloud chambers where you put two, uh, comb a combination of uh, nitrous oxide and a VOC together, uh, bombard it with sunlight, and you see what the ozone concentration is. And, th and these kind of chemistry experiments are conducted to, to look at the processes at work. And what you'll see is as you go up on the y-axis, we actually see um, uh, that high concentrations of nitrous oxide are actually removing ozone from the environment and leading to lower overall ozone concentrations. And this is considered sort of titration out of uh, the ozone. But the problem is that anthropogenic activities are driving both. We're, we're seeing the increase in nitrous oxide emissions and in VOCs through fossil fuel burning, through misuse of nitrogen fertilizers, and uh, by biomass burning, both natural and anthropogenic, we're sort of basically pushing ourselves in both the X and the Y direction on, on these kind of graphs. And that's a real problem. But I think a good way of demonstrating that is um, this little video here, which I'm going to show. Now, it's important to note this is a model output. So this is a, a model of atmospheric chemistry, taking into account all of our understanding of, of what's happening in the um, atmosphere. And it's showing ozone concentrations from 1950 up to the present day, or 2005. There's two things you should note. One is the general increasing in, in the hot colors, which is the high ozone concentrations. And the other is the seasonality of high ozone events. So if you look at, say, South America, Africa, and even Australia, you'll see this pulsing of uh, high ozone events, which is associated with the um, sort of fire season in those various regions. So if I just get this to play, it's a little bit fast, but you'll, you'll see it skipping through a couple of times. And you can see these very high concentrations are, are being found across much of the northern uh, hemisphere. But even in uh, the southern hemisphere, we're seeing considerably higher concentrations on average. And then also this high seasonality associated with episodic events. So what are the impacts of this ozone? We know ozone is increasing around the world. What are the impacts? Well, I mentioned that the ozone is highly reactive. And what happens is it actually enters into the plant and leads to the formation of so-called reactive oxygen species. Basically, it reacts with everything and anything and destroys it. Membranes, lipids, uh, proteins, 
it, it causes fundamental damage to the interior of the cells. And in doing so, it leads to both a reduced photosynthetic rate and an increase in maintenance respiration needed to basically replace all this damaged um, cellular machinery. Obviously, by modifying that ratio of photosynthesis to respiration, you lead to a reduction in total biomass accumulation or net primary productivity. And that has implications upon uh, the ecosystem, uh, even reducing the land carbon sink, which itself can lead to indirect mechanisms by where we're actually modifying the um, global carbon cycling, leading to further pronounced warming, which itself could lead to higher ozone due to um, high heat wave events. I say indirect there because there's actually a direct effect of ozone on global warming because ozone itself is actually the third most important uh, greenhouse gas after CO2 and water vapor. So it does have actually a direct effect on um, Earth energy models as well, but it has an indirect effect through the um, uh, carbon cycle. So we know it's increasing. We, we believe it's having this impact on plants, but I think it's important to sort of show to people exactly what we're talking about when we talk about these impacts. And the the potential impact of bad air quality, air pollution and ozone on plants have been recognized since the 50s. Yeah, in 1958, Richard Zedal noted these black lesions forming on vineyards in um, California. And they were associating this with bad smog events that were happening in, in the region. And so since that time, an awful lot of work has been conducted, often in temperate and Mediterranean type systems, to identify the potential implications of ozone damage on um, vegetation. And I think this is a really nice example here. So this is a, from a paper by Konoski and Thalka. So in this paper, what they did is they actually collected three clones of the same species, but three different populations from across the continental US. And they took them all to a field outside, just outside of New York, and they grew them there. And they grew them there for 10 years. And you will see that this tree on the right, nice, healthy, ozone tolerant uh, clone of the poplar, this tree was planted at the same time, but it's a sensitive um, poplar. So what we're seeing here is the profound implications of ozone on uh, biomass accumulation. Now, this is a, a kind of a extreme example as a showcase for what ozone can do, but I think it's indicative and, and shows what kind of damage that can happen. And consistently, uh, risk analysis has been conducted, looking at current ozone concentrations around the world. They've identified the United States, uh, Europe, uh, a lot of Southeast Asia, especially India, um, but also the coastal plains of China as being at great risk of current, even current ozone concentrations, but also future ozone concentrations moving forward. By, um, well, almost by necessity, a lot of research has been conducted in crop species. Obviously, our understanding of agronomic systems is always a lot better than natural systems due to just uh, financial gains. And so uh, a lot of work has been done in um, staple crops such as rice, wheat, maize, soy, those kind of things. And what we consistently see is that there are ozone impacts around the world. And these are quite significant. They range from about 6 to 16% yield loss can be attributable to ozone. So we're talking very real uh, quantities of food, which have implications both for food security, but also for economic productivity. Um, And so, yeah, this, this understanding of the implications of ozone in temperate systems is quite well advanced to the point where ozone sensitivity is being included in cultivar selection. So if you are a farmer in uh, parts of India, you will potentially select beans for growing uh, based upon an understanding of how they're likely to deal with the poor air quality. Uh, similar things are happening with rice um, in uh, parts of China uh, and soy in the United States. And so... Our understanding of um, ozone damage and how to potentially combat it in crop species and in temperate species is quite well advanced. How about the tropics? Well, one of the few studies to examine what the potential implications of ozone in the tropics is, was actually conducted by my second boss, Professor Stephen Sitch at the University of Exeter. I'll introduce you to that in, in a minute. But I think it's important to note that the implications of ozone are so well recognized in many um, temperate systems that a lot of work has gone into uh, improving air quality. There are international agreements on reductions in these precursors, the nitrous oxide emissions. Um, there's a so-called long range transport um, agreement, which is an acknowledgement by countries that really your emissions don't necessarily affect ozone in your neighborhood, but in your neighbor's neighborhood. And so uh, there are international treaties to try and reduce the precursor emissions and therefore the ozone concentrations in a much of the temperate world. But in the tropics, we're faced with a 
uh, different scenario where we have increased in industrialization, urbanization and land use change, which are driving all of the things which lead to higher ozone concentrations. And so, as I said, uh, Professor Stephen Sitch did a, a bit of an attempt to model the implications of um, predicted ozone concentrations running forward under realistic emission scenarios going forward um, and try to identify what could the potential damage running out to 2100 be on natural systems. So I won't go into the details of how the model was parameterized and modified, but basically they used best information on our understanding of how trees in temperate systems responded to ozone. And they looked at the predicted ozone concentrations observed in the tropics and they ran out spherous scenarios of 2100. And you get these kind of maps, which is showing the decline in um, gross primary productivity across much of the tropics. What gets really worrying is that this is the um, this is the model output when you you parameterize it using low sensitive uh, sorry low sensitivity to ozone trees. If you consider that all the tropical trees are going to be highly sensitive to ozone, you get something more like that, which is showing you know thirty percent declines in forest productivity across much of the tropical um, regions. Now, I stress this is a model. It's only as good as the data going in, and the data going in is based on temperate studies in a alpine meadow in Switzerland. You know, there, there is a major data gap there. But this is quite alarming. And on a similar scale, we start to see that at a, a regional scale, um, we can see the implications of ozone on tropical systems to be quite profound. So this is a modeling exercise done in South America where they looked at the implications on air quality of biomass burning in the arc of deforestation. So what you see is biomass happens in, in a sort of the region a neighboring intact forest where biomass is being burned due to land clearing. That poor air quality then passes out over the intact vegetation and has implications on the productivity of the intact vegetation. And what they saw in here is that the impacts on the intact vegetation were on of a similar magnitude of carbon loss as what was happening in the original biomass burning. So it's like a double whammy. You've burnt uh, some forest and then the pollution from that burning has then gone downwind and then reduced the productivity of your remaining forest. So again, potentially quite profound implications, but this is all a model. We don't really have good parameterization of uh, what might be happening in tropical systems, which is where um, sort of the nexus of our um, Chopper's project came in. So um, Chopper's is, a, is kind of a consortium effort led by three institutions, uh, the University of Exeter in the UK, James Cook University here in Australia, but also UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. They're the main, main consortium partners, but we also draw on the expertise and advice of a number of other partners uh, from around the world, Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute, University of Sao Paulo, uh, UK's Met Office and such like. Um, and so what we're attempting to address here is this big shortcoming in our understanding of how uh, tropical ozone is impacting and will impact in the future uh, our tropical forests. I think it's important to note here that this actually builds off work that was conducted um, back in 2012. So when back in 2012, before I came to Australia, I was working at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama, where I met Stephen, uh, and we came up with a, a little cheap, this was off a kind of a shoestring and uh, things we had laying around. But we built a little system which showed that even under the relatively modest ozone concentrations that you see in Panama and Gamboa, I'll, I'll get to what kind of concentrations they are later, but even under those levels, we are seeing uh, changes in leaf chemistry that are um, quite profound. So the project sort of in its entirety has three main components. There's developing a better mechanistic understanding of ozone um, sensitivity uh, in the tropics. There's model, uh, sorry, there's a monitoring component, which is getting a better understanding of what the exposure levels currently experienced by tropical forests are. And then there's a modeling component, which is bringing that information back together to better develop our understanding of how forests will be impacted in under future climate scenarios. So I'm going to be really focusing on these two components because that's probably all I'm qualified to talk about. I'm not going to be talking about the modeling, but I will touch upon that. If you're really interested in dynamic global vegetation models, I'll put you in touch with Stephen and you can talk about the jewels together. So at this point, I'd like to introduce you to um, the Tropos facility. So this is a facility that, as I said, is about 200 meters that way. Um, it was built to allow for um, the exposure of tropical trees to ozone under relatively uh, natural environments. So we're working, as I said, with partners in the UK. 
the average temperature in the UK doesn't come close to Cairns. So they're restricted to only being able to grow plants during a, a very limited window in the summer. Um, and even then it's not really having realistic temperatures or relative humidities. So here we can actually approach something that's a bit more reasonable. The process of building has been long and um, we won't go into it, uh, all the way from yeah, getting the right permissions from J various JCU uh, authorities all the way through to delays because of the wet season being too profound and we couldn't dig trenches, all the way through. But what we've done through this is end up in a situation where we have this, which is basically uh, what we refer to as a tropos experimental facility, which consists of nine open top chambers. Those open top chambers, uh, or OTCs, are each three and a half meters diameter, about two and a half meters tall. And each one of them is serviced by an individual air handler. I'll just, I'm not sure if the pointer will, there we go. So each by an individual air handler. So that air handler draws in ambient air, passes it through a particulate filter, through a charcoal filter to take out any ambient air pollution that there might be, and then blows it into the chamber at a rate of about uh, two cubic meters a second. Into that filtered airstream, we're then dropping uh, basically pure ozone, which we generate on site in the service hub. Whatever you do, do not call it a shipping container. It's definitely not a shipping container, it's a service hub. Um, that was a bone of contention with various uh, JCU authorities. So yes, uh, we're producing ozone in the service hub. That then goes out to the um, underground in lines to these air handlers. And by modifying the flow of that ozone into the airstream, we can uh, obtain different concentrations of uh, ozone in the chambers. Just turn that off. Yes. So uh, again, I would like to make a special thanks to all those that have helped me in actually the production of the system and what it entails. It includes various iterations, developing the air handler units, the sampling and control system. I'd like to make a particular thanks here to uh, both Andrew Gray Spence and Ben Lyons, who helped me with the technical side of getting these Raspberry Pis to help run everything, but also to uh, people in uh, Lucas's lab and Lucas himself, who's obviously helped me uh, greatly in getting this thing finally built. So we have these chambers, we have the ability to fumigate plants under a range of realistic ozone concentrations and see how they respond. And so I now like to talk to you about the kind of experiments that we're running here and what we're doing. Um, the first thing to note is that yes, they work. We can see a range in ozone concentrations within our chambers. This is actually, I'm just showing you three here because otherwise it gets a bit um, crowded. But yeah, we got the three different chambers. And what you can see is that from chamber four, which is our considered ambient, a chamber, we're adding ozone in various concentrations throughout the daylight hours. Now, traditionally, when people ran uh, studies to look at the impacts of ozone on, um, on plants, they looked at something called the accumulated ozone exposure above a threshold, AOT. And that threshold was often considered 40. So the idea is basically, if you're below that line, there's no damage to plants. And if you're above that line, there is damage to plants. Now, this was kind of a rule of thumb developed by observations in the field and the fact that if you went to places which had these naturally low levels of ozone below, say, 40 parts per billion, you didn't see ozone damage and other places you saw higher. And so when I say accumulated uh, uh, ozone exposure, what I'm talking about is basically that integrated area above the line. And so the idea would be that you grow up your plants under these various conditions, um, you integrate above that line for the length of the experiment, you would then look at how biomass varies between, in this case, chamber four, seven, and nine. And you might end up with some kind of relationship like this, where the final biomass of your plants grown under these various conditions shows a decline with increasing um, AOT 40. We could then put a, a relationship through that. And great, we can now uh, use that to predict how uh, vegetation will react under future concentrations of ozone. This is, uh, as I said, the historical way of examining ozone, ozone exposure and is something that's developed mainly in agronomic um, situations, often where you're dealing with a single species, often the same cultivar, where you're looking at irrigation systems and it works quite well there. The trouble comes when you start to look across species and you try and compare between different species. Um, and the reason it falls down is um, because of this region, reason, it's tomato. So as everyone knows from sort of high school biology, stomata are the point often on the underside of leaves where we see the interaction of 
um, gases in the atmosphere with the leaf. So we see the uh, inflow of CO2 into the leaf and water vapor coming out of the leaf. It's also the point at which ozone is going into the leaf. So if you can imagine uh, two situations um, just here, uh, where we have two plants, one of which on the left has a high stomatal conductance, one on the right has a low stomatal conductance, but the concentration of ozone sitting outside the leaf is exactly the same. Well, the, the plant with the low stomatal conductance basically doesn't care. It um, won't be seeing that ozone because the ozone needs to pass through the stomatal pore before it can start to interact with the um, uh, components inside the leaf. So instead of a concentration exposure um, model, what we've moved towards is a flux um, model, which basically uh, takes into account the concentration outside the leaf, uh, but then also takes into account the stomatal conductance that that leaf has to ozone. So GS is a general term for stomatal conductance to water vapor. And that's something that is well known um, between species and such like. Um, and then 0.663 is a, is a kind of correction factor based upon the differences in, in molecular diffusivity of ozone versus water vapor. But basically what we can do here is we can calculate the flux of ozone um, rather than just the concentration that the uh, plant is exposed to. And then what we can do is something very similar to the accumulation over time that we did for the AO240, where we basically calculate something called the phototoxic ozone dose. And although it looks at scary maths, basically all we're doing is we're summing the fluxes uh, hour on hour over time so that we end up with the accumulated total amount of ozone that can have passed into the leaf. And this allows us to be able to start to compare between species that have very different uh, stomatal conductances. But it's not quite as simple as that because stomatal conductance of a leaf is highly dynamic. So in higher plants, the stomata on a leaf will open in response to various abiotic and biotic conditions. You know, sunlight, water content, the humidity. Um, in some cases, even if the plant's being attacked by a predator, they'll actually um, result in closure of things. So it's, you can have quite a dynamic stomatal conductance, which has obviously implications on calculating this the flux of ozone into the leaf. So what we need to do is actually model on a, on a kind of hourly or even hopefully sub-hourly timescale the, the conductance uh, that the plant is observing, uh, then marry that with the concentration of uh, ozone to calculate the flux. And we're doing that in two ways. Um, first is an empirical approach. And basically what you do is you measure stomatal conductance under a range of conditions, various humidities, various light levels, you measure the stomatal conductance and you come up with some empirical relationships that you then apply to predict what stomatal conductance would be as things are changing over the course of uh, your experiment or even in, over the course of a single day. Uh, this empirical approach is the kind of standard approach used by a lot of people working in the agronomic industry, uh, partly because there's a very nice model which allows you to do this um, called the DOZE model, which is something we're actually going to be employing. Parallel to this approach, we're actually going to be doing something else, which is actually um, based on a more mechanistic understanding of how stomata function. And it's using a unified stomata model as set out by Linda Medlin. Um, and again, I won't get into the maths, but what it basically allow, is doing is looking at the operation of stomata uh, as it relates to the uh, roles of both photosynthesis and stomatal conductance and how that uh, varies with things like VPD, which is the vapor pressure deficit. Um, and it's this coupling of photosynthesis and conductance, which is key here. The reason this is quite a good approach, and believe me, it is a good approach, is that this representation of photosynthesis is a more mechanistic understanding of photosynthesis and is already implemented into a lot of global climate modeling. So the big GLMs that come out with, uh, they're a part of the CMIP-6, um, reports, you know, the IPC reports on future climate, their representation of photosynthesis in those models is this kind of form. And obviously, if we can uh, put our uh, results in this form, it's going to be a lot easier to put into a modeling framework. And so we're going out and we're collecting smart conductance measurements using a little handheld pyrometer under various environmental conditions. This is doing it at nighttime, to see what the, the nighttime conductance of the leaves was. And we're doing gas flux measurements using a uh, 
portable photosynthesis analyzer to get the relationship between stomatal conductance and, uh, in this case, photosynthesis um, or assimilation, A. And we're, so we're defining um, the parameters needed to allow us to model this stomatal conductance, which in conjunction with the ozone concentration will allow us to predict the um, phototoxic ozone dose, the PODY. And in both cases, uh, we need to obviously understand what the conditions in the chambers are over time. So we're modeling, or sorry, we're monitoring um, environmental conditions such as light levels, temperature, relative humidity, and such like. Um, we're kind of removing the issue of soil water content by irrigating, but that's something that can also be incorporated in it. And so in this way, our experiments are attempting to account for not only differences between species in terms of their stomatal conductance, but also how those species are responding to environmental conditions over time to help get a better idea of the, um, their response to ozone. But there's also one step further that we're also taking. Um, and this is something that was actually developed by collaborators on the project, uh, in particular, Johan Udling, working with uh, various colleagues in China. Um, and that was the fact that, or well, this was an attempt to explain why even when you take into account differences in conductance of leaves, even when you take into account the ozone exposure, there are still some species which seem to be sensitive to ozone and other species which are tolerant of ozone. And they were try trying to reconcile this uh, problem. And what they identified is the fact that if you take into account uh, a quite fundamental functional trait of the leaf, you could help explain some of this variation. And, and the trait they looked at was the leaf mass per unit area, so-called LMA. Now, anyone that does plant physiology work would be well versed in this, but for everyone else, um, LMA is basically how big and juicy your leaf is. So if you have a thick, high dense, highly dense, uh, thick cell walled leaf, you're gonna have a high LMA. If you're a thin, um, thin walled leaf, you're gonna have a low LMA. And what they found is that if you incorporated the consideration of leaf mass per unit area, LMA, you could help reconcile some of this difference uh, between the sensitive and the tolerant species. And, and they were very pleased, and I think they quite rightly so, that they got their R squared up from 0.42 to 0.56, um, explaining variation associated with ozone exposure. But I think you'll agree there's an awful lot of scatter still in that uh, diagram and this is the unexplained variation why is it that some species even when you account for their differences in stomatal conductance when you account for differences in their LMA why are some species more resistant than others um, and this is actually where uh, our PhD student Nahid comes in and so I'm not going to uh, talk about her results but she's actually investigating that variation why is it that when you account for everything else there's still variation and so she's uh, looking at a couple of very likely um, factors that might determine their plant sensitivity. In particular, uh, micromorphological structures, uh, basically the cell wall thickness, cell packing, the arrangement of cells, but also the chemical defenses that plants can employ to help combat um, oxygen. So as I said, uh, sorry, not oxygen, the um, ozone. As I mentioned, ozone is naturally available and there are other mechanisms which can cause the formation of reactive oxygen species uh, in leaves. And so plants already have a, an array of mechanisms to deal with that oxidative stress, so-called antioxidants. And so Nahid is really looking into this and is investigating that, and that's the sort of focus of her PhD. Now, at this point, I would love to show you the results of what we found. Uh, and trust me, the plan was to do that. Yeah, <laughs> When I agreed to give this talk, the idea was that we would be able to present finalized uh, under PODYs of the various six species that we've done to date and how we're continuing to build on that. Unfortunately, as those that um, are aware of things over the ERC, it all went a bit pear-shaped about a, uh, a month ago. As I mentioned, uh, ozone likes to react with everything, including our supply system. So I had to rebuild the ozone supply system, um, including our ozone generator. And that's basically been my life for the last month or so. And so I haven't been able to finalize that data. But we are in the process of doing this. We have, as I said, six species to date. Uh, we've got another two species in the chambers. There's another two about to go in. And that will be something that we continue to um, develop to provide the PODY response functions needed to predict how um, plants are reacting realistically in the tropics. Now, this is where I'd like to just touch upon the modeling. Um, so this is something that, as I said, is being conducted in the, at the University of Exeter in the UK. 
Um, so Professor Stephen Sitch is obviously the lead there, but there's also a new postdoc, Yimian, uh, um, who will be joining here in April. And so she's going to be taking the information and the response functions that we are developing here at the empirical side and combining that with predictions of uh, climate and ozone um, scenarios going forward and trying to better parameterize JAWS. So JAWS, as I said, is the, the Joint UK Land Environmental, System, Environmental Simulator. And that's the sort of the modeling framework that we've been using. The attraction here is that it's already in the process of, they're already in the process of modifying JAWS to take into account plant functional types or traits, sorry, such as LMA, leaf mass per unit area. And so there's ways we can start to actually ingest our understanding of how LMA impacts your ozone sensitivity an understanding of how LMA changes in the environment and the most current predictions of where we're going in terms of atmospheric chemistry and climate, bring that all together within that modeling framework and come out with a much better prediction of the current implications of ozone on tropical systems, but also the implications down the road under various emission scenarios. Now, here it's important to note that it's all based upon these model outputs and those model outputs are very well tested and parameterized and, and they try to incorporate satellite data because uh, there's currently, I think, three ozone um, detecting satellites. They try to collect data from um, the ground um, and try and incorporate it all together. It's important to note that the satellites that monitor ozone from, the, uh, from space only, are only able to collect information on the total ozone concentration of the total um, air column. So when it comes to predicting what the concentration the plants are exposed to at the ground, it may not be that great. And I think this quite nicely shows you the problem that we identified early on, which is the lack of monitoring of ozone across much of the tropics. Uh, to give you an idea of numbers, um, I mean, Africa, you've got a few in Western Sahara, but otherwise associated with oil refineries, but across much of uh, the middle of Africa, there's nothing. Um, this isn't complete, but this is the output from TOR. So TOR is the so-called Tropospheric Ozone Assessment Report, which is an attempt to collate all the information on ongoing ozone monitoring around the world um, and make that available for modelers to use to test against their atmospheric chemistry models. Uh, there's actually a second round of this, TOR 2, which is currently underway, and that will incorporate more data sources because this isn't complete. As I know, the, those that are familiar with the ATTO, the uh, Amazonian Tool Tower Observatory, they're monitoring um, ozone there outside of Manaus, and that data will hopefully be in the next iteration, but there's still a huge gap across lots of the tropics. Um, and even here in Australia, we're very poorly served with ozone monitoring. There's about 40 ozone monitors that are actually live across the whole of Australia compared to 4,000 in the United States. Um, and so we identify this as being a real shortcoming um, because if we're going to use these models to predict what the implications of ozone are likely to be, we need to be pretty confident those models that we're using um, have some veracity. And so a component of the, the Tropos framework was this regional monitoring in particular locations to try and help uh, ground truth uh, what, we've, what the model is predicting. So one of these is actually being conducted in uh, Barra Colorado Island in Panama. So as people may be familiar, given all the kerfuffle in sewers uh, recently, Panama has a huge quantity of boat traffic passing through it, huge shipping containers passing by um, every day, uh, similar magnitude in, in terms of shipping as being seen through Egypt. Each of those ships are burning thousands of litres of dirty fuel oil every hour, um, and that forms a lot of nitrous oxide emissions. So the suggestion was that Panama should be really a hotspot of, uh, of ozone as compared to uh, other systems. And so uh, in conjunction with uh, researchers at the University of Princeton, but also there in Panama, we thought about putting an ozone monitor into an existing system, which was look, using eddy covariance to look at um, productivity of the forests. So I won't go into detail of that, but it's a... Yeah, Eddy covariance is a technique which allows you to look at the productivity of a system by looking at gas fluxes at a kind of landscape level. And so the idea is that by marrying that with our monitoring of ozone, we can start to see what the implications of seasonal differences in ozone might be on productivity of the system. Interestingly, we don't find much ozone in Panama or not on Barracolard Island. Um, what we actually find that is happening is that we're too close to the shipping. So this eddy flux tower is probably only about 500 meters from where those big shipping containers steam past. 
And so what we're probably seeing is the, the very high nitrous oxide emissions that are being produced there are basically just titrating out all the ozone from the atmosphere. And actually, if we went downwind a little bit further, we'd probably see something similar to what we are in uh, Manaus, where there's this plume of ozone downwind. Uh, but this research island is um, slap bang in the, in the actual canal. Um, and so the, uh, it's likely to not be seeing very high ozone, although it is seeing large quantities of nitrogen deposition, which have implications in itself. Um, the next example um, that's worth, that we're very excited about is actually um, some collaborations with uh, researchers at the University, oh, sorry, uh, at University of Ghent, um, the CAVE lab uh, in Belgium. And they've been working with researchers in the Democratic Republic of Congo in developing what will be one of the first and only eddy covariant systems in the Congo basin. Uh, so called Congo Flux, and this is very exciting because, as I said, there's very little monitoring of um, processes happening in the middle of um, Congo. And so in the middle of, and despite a pandemic, they've been able to get this tower flux up and running. And so there's some really exciting data coming out of their uh, site, including the fact that we're seeing really high ozone concentrations. So here we are at the middle of the green bit of Africa, you know, miles from any uh, potential um, or immediate air pollution, we would have thought, but um, we are seeing very high ozone concentrations. Yeah, 75, 80 parts per billion um, in the, in the middle of the day at some uh, months. Uh, why is this? Well, this little video on the right I'm just going to show, it kind of exemplifies what's going on. And so to quickly um, uh, outline, the red pixels are fire spots that are happening as detected by Bodo satellites. The little white trail is the air path of air that's passing over the flux site in the past week. So it gives you an idea of where that air has come from. And what you're going to see when I start this video up is the seasonality of biomass burning happening in the savannah regions and unfortunately encroaching on, on forested systems and how the wind from this biomass, pers biomass burning is actually passing over our pristine, quote unquote, um, forest site with the implication of actually producing high quantities of ozone. So as I let that run, what you'll see is the seasonality of the biomass burning. So here we are in the southern hemisphere and then that switches more to the northern hemisphere. But there are periods of time when that air is passing directly over our site. So this forest is directly impacted by both natural but mo uh, many uh, human set fires happening in the surrounding environment. And so this is, it had been suggested by the models, um, but this is the, some of the first ozone concentration data from um, Africa that's allowing us to actually um, fine tune the models. And that's something that's being conducted by a PhD student, uh, Fossie Brown at the University of Exeter. So what she's doing is taking this regional modeling, uh, monitoring, sorry, uh, looking at the ozone models, atmospheric chemistry models, and trying to uh, better represent ozone that we observe in the, in the natural world. And this will be key to marrying with our information on how ozone impacts um, vegetation. Um, to all bring that all together to then predict what the implications of ozone will be in uh, tropical systems. So with that, um, I'd just like to talk very briefly about some uh, future experiments and what we're currently conducting at the moment. So as I said, we've currently got trees growing over in the chambers. Um, that will be continuing for the foreseeable. But we've also just started a new grant. So this is working um, uh, with collaborators from Brazil, Italy, and here in Australia, both at UQ and at JCU. And what we're investigating is the role that ozone might be playing on sugarcane production. So in Brazil, sugarcane is, is, um, is a massive industry. Uh, to give you an idea, just in Sao Paulo state alone, I think it's five or 10 times the total sugarcane area represented in, in the whole of Australia. Oh, sorry, no, that's incorrect. One variety in Sao Paulo represents the entire output of Australia. So, and that variety represents 20% of their total output. It's it, astronomical numbers. But this production of sugarcane is happening in a region that's also so it sees very low air quality and potentially high ozone concentrations. And so the question is, uh, what is the cost of that? Uh, and with a view that there is the potential there to modify um, and promote good air quality if we can put a dollar value on well, you're losing X number of uh, billions of dollars uh, 
because you're not getting the productivity you should be getting from your sugarcane. And with these agronomic systems, I mean, a 16% yield gap is highly significant and something that um, obviously the farmers really want to chase down. So this is work that will be conducted uh, here for the next two years. If anyone wants to get involved, please help, because I've got more than enough to do. Um, but it, this is quite an exciting avenue. With that, I'd like to thank all, all the partners involved. I'd like to thank the funding bodies. Uh, and again, thank you to all the people that have helped um, help out. So with that, I'll be happy to take any questions.